ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the show. We have a special guest here today, none other than Mr. Schuler Hernstrom, author, uh, miniatures enthusiast, and going off his bio, a well-traveled badass. How are you doing today? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I've managed to get the dogs to calm down a little bit so we can do this without too much interruption, hopefully. Thank you for having me. Like really really appreciate it. Mm. Uh, so, I w- oh, actually, wait a sec. Should probably oh. have this plugged in. There we go. Okay, that's going to be a bit better for my case. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So, as I was saying, you have a pretty impressive bio before we even get into the authorial issues uh, what can you tell me about being a paratrooper oh um i should preface everything <clears throat> my career in the army was fairly brief and without a lot of glory so but am I. I, <laughs> I was um uh in the infantry and then went airborne and i was in the 82nd the uh 505th for a short time. I actually really liked it. Uh, really liked it. Uh, a lot of, you know, uh, people, veterans know what I'm talking about. Like, uh, it's really, really, really shitty, but there's something about it. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, uh, factors to it that, that, um, make it a very, they appeal to certain parts of the, uh, very very deeply um and that was uh got assigned to my unit was having a good time and then i got diagnosed with hodgkin's disease oh and that that uh ended my military career prior to that i'd spent a couple years abroad and prior to that i was actually in the navy stationed out of japan uh, as an intelligence specialist which is um which was pretty ridiculous but it was a good time and i got you imagine essentially just free travel and, uh, you know, it's good. It's, it's, uh, I have a lot of fond memories of sitting on a Swanson deck and watching flying fish skitter across the... Uh, I'm beginning to think I may have made a mistake joining the Army back in the day instead of the Navy. Everyone who joined the Army made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was a signals operator uh, based off here in uh, Quebec City in the uh, Valcartier uh, military base. Oh, wow. Basically, basically just, you know, refitting radios and cleaning mm-hmm. trucks for the most part. <laughs> We were uh, assigned to, to help out with the 22nd uh, mechanized uh, garrison. Oh, that's Basically cool. like a support team, team for them. Yeah, yeah. I always was envious of guys that had um, got any kind of technical skill at all. Even, yeah, I mean, they lie. I mean, nothing really, nothing really directly applies. I think um, <laughs> one friend of mine, he was an x-ray tech. And he did it because he, this guy actually did research and he figured out that he could go into the military, get trained as an x-ray tech and come out and have a pretty decent job. And then you know, he was like, well, no, he was all square. He was all straight. Like, <laughs> and, um, but he was the only person I knew that, that was kind of smart like that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Everybody yeah. else was like, oh, you know, whatever. I knew another guy when I was in uh, an Intel that learned, he taught himself Unix. And that's when, you know, there weren't a lot of people doing do it. that yeah so he got out and he was making he was making money hand over fist but um lost touch with him i hope he transitioned to something else because now that's not all that impressive from what i understand you know what i mean well yeah i was an early in, adopter. yeah i worked a bit in software i was a you know dev tester over at activision for a while and a couple other things and yeah if you don't keep up really really assiduously with the the advancements yeah. in tech you're gonna fall behind pretty damn quick like my coding experience is completely out of date by now yeah it's just it's rough but everything's yeah. rough out there it's all good yeah um yeah military was um and uh it's a funny thing too because of the cancer uh you know i didn't deploy i didn't go to afghanistan or iraq or anything mm-hmm. and um <clears throat> Yeah, it's really paradoxical because uh, I saw my friends go and, um, you know, that's came back, yeah. Feeling. But at the same time, I mean, it, you know, looking back after all this time, you know. Yeah, I've got, you know, friends who came back from there and it didn't sit well with them, to say the least. Yeah, I never heard anyone say a good word about any of it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. uh and uh, I'll never not feel bad, not feel guilty for not going with them. But, um, you know, 
that's how you know that's how life works yeah and, uh, yeah roll with the punches i guess yeah guys a lot tougher than me coming back with a lot of problems you know i'd probably be in a pretty sorry state yeah <sighs> you know like i said it is what it is it is what it is and, uh fate we have no idea why god does the things he does so here we are yeah well in any case you've managed to do pretty well for yourself given the amount of stuff that you've seen you have published you have gotten a very very good repertoire of stories my friend thank you very much um it's been uh it's been really interesting um and you know i have a it's it's difficult to try to you know there's there's a typical path that people go on when they sort of they get online they they start to write they get a piece or two published you know they blog and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um uh and I, I found that, it, you know, just, just not to be misunderstood. That's some of my friends have done that. And they're totally ace guys. You know what I mean? There's, there's some blogs out there that I read. Um, but there's, a, there's this whole sort of mythology about being a writer. And uh, I don't know. I just. Yeah, you know, the I'm whole artist, about. the whole artist profession, regardless of what the art is, typically yeah. gets mythologized a lot. Sometimes by the artists themselves, and oftentimes just by the people who are selling the art. Yeah, and uh, there's writing. There's there's you know, I it's you know like I could be making cabinets. It doesn't matter. I'm making something. It, you know, if, if someone might encounter it, it will give them pleasure, or it will not, mm -hmm. and then they'll they'll move on. Maybe check out something else I have, but uh, I'm just not interested in the whole sort of milieu it just gets a little gets a little weird and like i said having said that like um i have really good friends of mine that are active on social media and uh my buddy buddy um alexander constantin mm -hmm. he's uh he's got this incredible blog he writes all this this uh really poignant stuff you know what i mean so it's not as if that's that that's some sort of invalid path or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, what he's doing and what some of my other friends are doing, it's not really what I'm talking about. Um, Everybody has their own path that they follow. Yeah, yeah. And like, you got to just you gotta avoid that, um, you know, avoid a lot of traps out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's there's tons and tons and tons and tons of people more successful than i am so i never well, want certainly to tons and tons of people the, less successful than yeah, as well like so i don't want to ever presume to give advice or anything like that um i just i've had an absolutely incredible time making stuff writing these stories and it's been extremely surprising and fun and satisfying uh when someone comes up and says hey that's that's pretty cool. You know, I read that. That's awesome. And um, it feels really good because, um, yeah, I, like I write for myself. I write, I write, you know, like this is cool. This is fun. This is neat. This is, this is savage. This is, this is tragic. This yeah. And I think that reflects yeah, itself it in yeah, your, so, your stories themselves. So like um, um, if I was the last person alive, uh, you'd still be writing, leaving, leaving aside you know whatever however time it makes to zombie proof my house or whatever you know what i mean um you know i'd still be making stuff yeah but uh so with that in mind it, it, it's it's extremely special when when someone says when someone gets it when someone you know when i when i'm talking to somebody you know an email or whatever you know and they talked about how they were affected by something that's really, that's really awesome. This is really profound sort of human thing because I was affected by it. That's, that's why I made it. You know what I mean? That's why, yeah. I, that's where it came from. So that's just so, that's just so cool. You know yeah. what I mean? That's Speaking of so being cool. affected, just going back to how do you really get into the fantasy, heroic fantasy kind of genre as, you know, when you first started reading? Yeah, I was like, I was raised on it. Um, uh, my dad, uh, 
was really good friends with this guy named P. Skyler Miller. And he was a couple, he was a couple years older than my dad. Um, probably a lot of years older than my dad, but uh, they were, they both worked together. Um, they both worked together. My dad was a graphic artist at the time and P. Skyler Miller wrote copy and they worked in a, um, you know, in this catalog department at this place called Fisher Scientific. It's a big company here, or used to be. Uh, and P. Skyler Miller was um, uh, like the first one of Robert, e., if not the first, one of the first bibliographers for Robert E. Howard. You know, he um, corresponded with him occasionally, like in my paperback collection, <clears throat> it might be Howard or something else, but the forward will be by P. P. Skyler, Skyler Miller. Miller. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my dad had thousands of paperbacks and uh, he was always, you know, we were always just, and we grew up during the, uh, the heyday of the video store. My dad would always mm -hmm. come home from work. He'd stop. He'd like have some crazy ass movie or something. It was just, there was uh, always something cool going on. And, uh, you know, w I, when I was coming up, um, it was the beginning of this, the, all the, there were a bunch of changes in the industry that have been documented by um, people a lot smarter than me mm -hmm. about how publishing worked and how, how these things were being consumed. Yeah, Jeff Rowe Johnson, so, uh, mutual yeah, like, it, acquaintances, it, has gone into depth which, on that. That is a really incredible article, even about things like, um, you know, when I was a kid, there were paperbacks in grocery stores mm. and grocery stores were <coughs> in grocery stores, drug stores you know, all these uh, things and uh, distribution was handled at like a local level. Some some guy in that grocery store would look at a, the catalog from the distributor and check what he wanted. So there's just always this tremendous amount of variety, tremendous amount of weird stuff. And, um, you know, there was there was the mid-list author. There was a, mm -hmm. an individual that could write fantasy or science fiction and make a living. Yeah. And there was just just so much stuff out there. And, you know, 70s, 60s and 70s, um, you know, I wasn't reading Howard and Weird Tales. I was reading reprints of Howard. My dad was reading reprints of Howard, but maybe some Weird Tales, too. But, um, you know, so all, all that stuff was sort of getting codified in the 60s and 70s, 70s, especially with the paperbacks. Yeah. And then- um, The Lancer we, paperbacks. And yeah, the oh yeah, they saw all these guys, all yeah. that stuff. I've just got a couple yeah, of all uh, the Jack old Man. ones from way back yeah. in the day. I've got, to, I've actually got some of the old ones. Here in Quebec, they're mostly a lot of French stuff for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, and a lot of you know European imports. Mm -hmm. I've got some uh, original paperbacks from the old Bob Moran uh, by Henri Verne. It's oh, like, wow. you know, yeah, you know, the Ming, the Yellow Shadow, and you know, yeah, him, yeah, Valentine to duking it out with the guy. That was some good stuff. Gradually, you know, everything in our civilization is just headed toward um, uh, not everything. You know, doesn't doesn't do anyone any favors to over exaggerate or generalize. But um, you know, like if I walked into a, a Rite Aid here or a Rite Aid uh, in another state, there's going to be the same you know 10 paperbacks there yeah and just the way you know everything's changed um in some ways it's better some ways it's worse but uh but i grew up at a really good time to get all the old stuff and um you know the that second generation writers guys like vance and mm -hmm. um pole and uh i just want to look back and look and frederick uh well, anyway, <laughs> there's name drop. But, uh, you know, just tons of stuff. And um, it's kind of like, almost like a, like a time capsule. Yeah. Um, I remember as a kid, you know, reading, um, there, were, there were a couple digest-sized uh, science fiction and fantasy periodicals. Um, again, chronicled by people a lot smarter than me. Um, that stuff was not designed to appeal to a 13 year old. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. And, and it was just like, oh, God. You know, very talky, more, you know, yeah, yes, we're expanding yeah. great ideas. So much. To, who cares about character and plot? <laughs> and, uh, but always, you know, there's always, I always had a Conan book laying around or, and um, every year, 
I ritualistically reread a couple of Vance novels, like the Demon mm-hmm. Prince novels, which I'm rereading right now. And um, and I, I like to read a lot of nonfiction and, uh, as, you know, especially European history, but all history, everything's interesting. Yeah, well, that's um, pretty much the basis of, you know, where Sword Story started. It was yeah, absolutely. Adventure, like, uh, historical adventure fiction, and mm-hmm. they just added in the, you know, fantastic element. That's how we got it. Yeah. And um, it, it just seemed like, and I started writing um, almost by accident in, in about, I don't know, 2014. And uh, it was just kind of dead. I mean, there's, there's, there's no, I don't think there's ever in history been more writers. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And, um, well, yeah, with the internet having basically oh, democratized, God. you know, yeah. art in a certain sense, everybody can just put up whatever the hell they want any time they want. But um, I'm sure it was out there somewhere, but I wasn't finding it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just just made things just exactly as how I would want them. You know what I mean? Just and without. You know, it's a very solitary thing, and uh, I don't. You know, if you read enough history, you get a. Um, it's a real mistake. It, it, you know, it's very paradoxical, and there's all these paradoxes that I'm obsessed with. Mm-hmm. But um, there is absolutely no difference between a human being now and, and a human, human being, being ten thousand years in ago. A, in a, yeah or in a medieval village in England. Um, And at the same time, uh, there are a lot of superficial differences about how one would perceive the world and a lot of things and sort of- It's the same passions and urges from, you know, centuries or millennia ago, it's just filtered through a different cultural and social lens. And we hear about like, um, In a sense, we live in a secular society, but but all human beings are religious, you know, whether they want to admit it or not. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that you can you can grasp on to like a lot of just eternal, immutable things about human beings, and then you uh, place them into situations, and uh, you know, just sort of revel in the outcomes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But it, it's just, yeah, just calling back to what I was saying earlier, it's just, it's been a blast, you know. Yeah. It's an interesting thing because a lot of times people will make a distinction between character-driven stories and plot-driven stories. But mm-hmm. the best stories are both in a certain sense. The plot yeah, is dictated like, by the characters that are in it. In yeah. The situation. And like, uh, and I think a lot of the stuff too, it's like, you know, um, sound like an idiot here but like i'm used to it. um <laughs> like uh you know when i sit down to write you know i'm just i'm just i'm just doing it and and like um you know how the more i you know there's a certain obviously it's an intellectual exercise and you have to be thinking what's going to happen next why does this matter well why did i Every single thing on the page has to have a purpose. Every single word, you know, a word within a sentence, a sentence within a paragraph, a paragraph within a section or a chapter, the chapter within the story. Everything has to work. Everything has to work. And like, um, uh, you know, like any creative or, or anything like that, you know, when you encounter your own work, um, sometimes I can, I can sink right into the vibe. And other times I'm like, oh, you know, I could have done that. It can take a little while to get yourself into it. Yeah, but um, there's a point where, like, uh, you know, to to dissect the frog and find out everything about it, you got to kill it. Yeah, it takes some uh, of the magic out of it that can take you out of that. uh, But but there, I mean, these are things that need to get figured out and they need to be thought about. And um, literary (laughs) criticism, at least it used to be, um you know, like very, very, very profound, um, difficult stuff. Like I'm trying to go through this um, John Gardner, uh, the art fiction fiction recommended to me by, uh, I've been working with this gentleman, um, Neil Durando, who set up Pylon Press. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a refugee from 
New York Publishing. Oh, my condolences. Uh, yeah, but it's it's great. It's like um, it's like uh, you know, he was there before, sort of the, the big sort of shifts in our society, and um, so he's he's got like amazing chops, and he's helped me to more be more deliberate and to think in better ways about what I'm doing. Um, the last thing, I think the last thing I published, the Mortu and Kairos, uh, The Judgment of Dog and Ha. Which is available uh, in this book right here. Yeah. The Ultimate Men. Um, work with his edits on that. And that's yeah. probably the tightest thing I've ever, ever written. It's a good story. I like it a lot. It's real meat and potatoes. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, I'm going to blather on and on and sort of forget about the big news is that, um, I don't know when it was, 2016? 2016, 2016, I self-published a bunch of stories that I had in the can. Since, since then, I've, I've, there have been more markets and I've discovered more markets, but I was in this incredibly like fruitful period and I was sitting all this stuff that like I, I liked it a lot and um, didn't see it going anywhere. And um, I was at that time, I was sending a lot of stuff to Kirsova and Alex was digging it. But like I can't have you know you can't yeah. have Kurosawa was where I first uh, encountered your yeah, yeah. Uh, first He's, story the uh, yeah, gift of the was, mob men in the very first issue. I mean, that was all pure fake because I was uh, checking up on uh, Jeff Ron Johnson's blog and he mentioned it and I just I emailed the guy and boom 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 and we we're in business. It was fantastic. Um, Thune's vision. Uh, it's funny too. Like I don't Google myself. Uh, so via Instagram. Uh, uh, this cool cat I follow, the back, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, somebody, mm -hmm. uh, these guys associated with the Chromecast. Um, oh, yeah, I listened to that cool too. Thing. Yeah, they were talking about, um, one of the gentlemen on there was talking about Thune's Vision and how it wasn't available anymore. <laughs> and, like, oh, I know, like, an edition coming out, but like, you know, I, I need to set up a website. I've been meaning to do it now for like two years, but, um, because there's no way to find out anything. <laughs> But um, so Thune's Vision is going to come out with a second edition. Uh, it'll be available in, in trade paperback and hardback. Nice. Um, the, and it's going to get crowdfunded. Depending on the crowdfunding level, uh, there might be illustrations. You know, I've got some new material working. I'm working on uh, that Neil's real psyched about. So if Neil's psyched about it, I'm, I'm on the right track. Yeah. Are you doing um, illustrations? I think it was you who did the cover yeah, for the original Thunes I did the yes. cover for the original. Uh, I've got some illustrations and I'm working on some more. Um, nice. And uh, I love doodling. I love drawing. Not particularly good, but just maybe good enough. But <laughs> um, this Kickstarter, Indiegogo, I don't even know what it is going to be. Uh, I think Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Kickstarter or the crowdfund is probably going to start at the end of October. End of and October. it's going to be a big time. And um, it's going to be a blast. Uh, I'm looking forward yeah, to got, it. Yeah, I've got so much good feedback over Thune's vision. I think for a lot of people, um, it sort of came out of nowhere. And uh, it, I mean, it came out of nowhere for me. <laughs> You know, just deep right. well so for me. I was, you know, I read a couple of your stories in Kursova, the gift of the Ob Men. Then later on, it was the image of the goddess. Yeah, and later. that was in the later issue. And then I started looking. Okay, what else has this guy done? And I started looking at. Oh, he's got a collection. Okay, I can pick that up. Yeah, yeah. And then I, was, you know, actually got it and started looking through it. And it's some great stuff. I liked. Uh, well, Athan and the Priestess is probably one of my favorites. One that's of my favorites probably, in there. Uh, that's probably the, uh, got to be in the top five of the things I've written. Um, yeah. that just that just spilled out like a like a like a dream you know what I mean it, it, yeah. just, it just uh it just felt right from start to finish and it, it, it all just started with the image of um off on you know on a, on the step on his horse just looking grim and it just and then um thinking about the village shaman and, and the divisions that he might have under the influence of, of, uh, you know, mushrooms, yeah, mushrooms. And psychedelics and, and just, and it just all coalesced and it, it just like, um, there's all these little 
beautiful parts that I always come back to. Like, you know, he goes under the river and he's in those ghosts, zombies, you know, whatever they are, like wraiths. Um, mm -hmm. He encounters those guys and you think, oh man, he's gonna, he's gonna have to hack his way out of this one. And they just want to know what happened, what the outcome of the battle that they were in. And they're, they're mostly concerned with their king who mm -hmm. they love. They love their king. And when they find out that that battle was hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, um, then they find out that, that the, the blood of that king is in Athens, Athens people. And they just see, yeah, we see a little of him in you. And they're just, that was all they needed. And then they, they just disagree. Through. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just um, little moments like that. It was such a, and that one kind of has, um, it's real short. I'm talking it up like it's. um. Yeah. In the book, like it starts page 17 and ends page 43 here. Yeah. So it's not too long, but, you know, it not goes on at a good pace. It's got a lot of, you know, interesting little events happening on the way yeah. as he travels from, you know, to his destination. I won't do, put any spoilers mm -hmm. out there, but yeah. And I like the final ending there. It reminds me a bit of, you know, the, the kind of epilogue here. It kind of reminds me a bit of uh, when Gift to the Odd Man, the final, like, couple of yeah, paragraphs yeah. of that story that kind of like mm -hmm. almost like not really philosophical but kind of in a certain way way it's written well, I think, you know it's like um it like puts the pin on the pin on the point kind of so yeah and like there's like so i, I have um um like a character like conan um you know in my mind conan is still out there wandering you know what i mean mm -hmm. like yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I have uh, recurring characters now. Mortun Kairos, they've been in. Oh, that I've got an, another Mortun Kairos in the can, nice. and that'll be released. Uh, I'm not sure when, but that'll be in sort of the second volume of that um, uh, anthology from Pylum. Oh well, I've got an extra reason uh, to buy it then. Yeah. So like, so that's going to be a collector's edition. Same guys and uh, um. You know, I may or may not ever resolve their stories. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you but, don't have to. Act might, yeah, like it, it might. It, as as I continue to write them, it might feel appropriate and natural for me to end their stories. But, um, but that's not nothing stopping you from then just going back and telling more of their stories. Than yeah, before that. But so they're they're always going to be on the road. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, the for all eternity, they're on the road. Um, which is perfect, the, which is really yeah. you know the perfect encapsulation of like that particular uh, pulp mm -hmm. adventurer heroic fantasy style. The yeah. origin and the final ending are completely unimportant. It's the journey. Yeah. And it's all the adventures yeah. that happen in between that are the real focus. And then a character like Athon, um, he's part of this grand machine that's that's much bigger than he is. Mm -hmm. As and he it, learns it, to his expense. And at one point, his his part of it is done. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I think like um, in that story, it felt very very natural that like um, his part in that is finished. And like you know. Um, you can imagine that 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 um you know we're all changed constantly by all of our experiences but he wasn't you know he just went back to his people and he went back to his ways and um he had a fate that was uh, expected for one of his people you know and that was it you know and in his part it was done and it's just a short epilogue about uh the events that came after you know, that just yeah. felt very, very, very natural. You know what I mean? Yeah. I also like the way it was kind of foreshadowed in the previous then when he starts having, he has a little vision of such, and then, you know, his end basically comes exactly as predicted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the shamans yelling at him, telling him, <laughs> you know, he has Never this ignore your shaman. small opportunity to be have uh, some place, uh, yeah. have a role larger than what would be expected for him. Yeah. yeah, if that story and the final story, the short novella, the saga of Adel Wolf, are of yeah. any indication, always listen to the guy who talks to the gods because yeah, he's got <laughs> some good advice generally. Yeah, and that was um that was a lot of fun to write. Oh yeah, and, um I get I get kind of sick of seeing not so much in writing but um in sort of popular media um 
you know, from what I've read and, and thought about and, and related back to life experiences, like um, if you were to catapult somebody, uh, you know, I take like the people I've run across in my life that have been genuine, like scary guys, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. You catapult them back into the dark ages and they would likely just be curled up in a fetal position. You know what I mean? After yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like, like, um, you know. They're uh, tough, but they're tough for our time yeah, period yeah. with all the creature comforts yeah. and, you know, the ability I mean, to call the cops at any time. You know what I mean? But like, uh, you know, like a Viking raid, um, that was incredibly, incredibly if that happened now or if it happened in your city or something and you know things like that do happen in the mm-hmm. world today right now this minute yeah. but uh it's incredibly uh violent and shocking yeah. and it just chaotic and, everything yeah, you know gets you would never left and right and, it if you saw it you know what i mean and if you um so i mean um once again calling back to that paradox i mean people are the same and they're different mm-hmm. um uh, you know, all of us have that capacity within us, but it has to be all the context and everything and has to be correct to bring it out. But in the dark ages, everything was set up and it was coming out yeah. and, you know, people were, were, were ready to go. And uh, um, it's like, imagine being back in those days, being in a shield wall, like both of us oh, have yeah. had military training, but we have nothing that relates yeah. to that. I mean, the closest thing to that would probably be like, you know, uh, riot police these days and even then yeah. they're not expecting the same level of you know hack and slashery that you know, yeah. they had back then and you know uh broken record here talking about paradox um you know horrifying and utterly thrilling at the same time i knew a guy who had been a cop in a on a relatively small town in uh texas i think it was and there was um an area of the town a real bad area where there was uh uh, maybe it was a block party or something, but things were getting completely out of hand. And essentially they had a riot on their hands and with the equipment and the personnel they had, it, it was basically, you know, this guy I knew and two other cops, three guys. Oof. And he said, they put on all that crap and they had shields and they had um, uh, long clubs and it, they just drove up, jump out of the truck. And they, he said, they just screamed like madman and ran into the crowd. And, um, the shock of it and the insanity of it was enough. They, they successfully quelled a riot. These three guys, you know Mor- what I mean? Like, <laughs> morale is know. everything. If you can, yeah, yeah. The, morale, <laughs> yeah. Can... <clears throat> the riders failed that check for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The oh yeah. I'll buy it. Let's, let's roll. See what happens. But yeah. um, it's like a. From my understanding, the vast number of fatalities and casualties in the ancient warfare was largely when one side routed and the other side yeah. just steamrolled them. Yeah. Afterwards. Once, once you're no longer, you know, holding. Once you're no longer pushing. You know what I mean? Then, then it just it's all exponential. Just melts away. Yeah, to try to get to that. And you lose one, and that person loses the morale for the people around them, and then so on and so forth. Until yeah, just... and you know whether you're Christian or not, or anybody is, we are our entire framework has all been been formed by that because that that civilization um, existed for so long in the West. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really hard for us to think otherwise. And one of the things I wanted to do with Saga Avada Wolf is is to show like how unbelievably brutal uh that society was and Mm -hmm. and how um you know when you read the sagas you know and and you know there's certainly there's scholars of these things and people that have read them more and closer than i have but like um you know that the the gods are not very frequently any sort of source of comfort no you know and there's no, there's no salvation. There's no, you know, um, there's, there's, it, it's just, you know, we're just animals, you know, and like um, a rich person that can make large sacrifices is inherently more important and valuable than, you know, a poor person or someone, you know, just some poor farmer or something. Yeah. And, uh, 
And if you can't defend yourself, if you can't stop someone from killing you and taking your stuff, then tough shit. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. what are you going to do? What are you going to, you know, like, you're not going to call the cops, you know, and, and it's just, it's just tough luck. Now, I think inherently, you know, murder and things like that, they're obviously um, taboos and things that cross cultures and cross times. Yeah. But when you look at, um, uh, northern and western europe at that time then i won't speak to other regions necessarily don't you know we think about the steppe and the mongols and russia and everything else too mm -hmm. but um there was you know just like a, a massive surplus of of undirected violence and and you know when you look at sort of the formation of the modern world you're looking at this long torturous period of getting from um you know, if, you know, just war bands uh, all the way up to someone punching a clock and sitting in a cubicle. And that that's a hell of a difference, isn't it? Over, yeah, that did not happen overnight. No. That that took a lot. There was a time in medieval England where almost every single crime that you could possibly commit was oh, punishable yeah. by death. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you had, like, you know, like, like 10 year old, old, you had 11 year olds being hung for pickpocketing at one point. Yeah, and it's like, and it's like they got everything everything that might upset a, a stable order you know like just whacked out of the gene pool Yeesh. but uh you know and it's just like when i you know i'm babbling now but it calls back to like saga of outer wolf and i just i just wanted to try to capture that just put myself in there and just just think about yeah. it and, and steam in it and ruminate and and soak it up and um um you know it's not it's not pretty and the idea of someone having the favor of the gods and losing the favor of the gods, that's very common. And oh, yeah. uh, I've been recently actual... been reading the Iliad recently, and that oh, happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, the Greeks have the favor of the gods, minutes. and then, yeah. you know, Agamemnon takes the uh, da daughter of the high priest of Apollo, and, you know, all of a sudden everybody's getting plagues, and then he takes, you yeah. know, Achilles' girl because he has to send that one back, and Achilles mm -hmm. gets all poo prideful about it and just fucks off to his tent. And yeah. then uh, Paris, uh, Aphrodite likes Paris. So then all of a sudden you have Ares and Aphrodite on mm -hmm. the side of the Trojans and then everybody yeah. else inside of the Greeks. And it's just a clusterfuck. <laughs> yeah. And like this, is like, um, and, and, you know, if, if, if you're portraying a pagan world, um, you know, you need, you need to, to, to do the work to to sort of show that you know you need to um you know shift gears and really think about mm -hmm. it and that's really that was the main goal of that um out of wolf stuff and that's the problem not i don't know you know i don't want to roast stuff too much because it's not like i'm i'm not even checking it out at this point but like a lot of um a lot of modern fantasy feels uh, like it's in the modern world yeah and like, like you have fantasy to, and you can you can write a story where people have horse carts but they think like us mm -hmm. but you have to tell you have to to even just in shadow and just in hints and just in uh, just you have to somehow intimate to me why that is the way it is you know what i mean we have a preconception of how medieval people acted or thought and for better or for worse um but you know, like if you know, technology and culture are, are intertwined uh, yeah. to a greater, lesser degree. It's to a very great degree, debate. I would say. Yeah, I mean, we see it like this, just mass psychosis now. Um, I mean, just look on Twitter. I mean, it's cool. it's just like. Do I have to? I'd rather not as much. As yeah, I can. it's like it's like the, is that how human beings are, or is that how they're being made to act? I mean, like, uh, you know, that's going to be a problem for aliens to figure out. You know whether or not they want to exterminate us but um speaking of aliens uh, you uh, <laughs> a little segue the uh, we previously mentioned uh mortu and just get their names right mortu and kairos yeah mortu and kairos mm -hmm. those are particular that things you move there from a you know the historical period of uh the the saga about a wolf and the more you know sword and sorcery milieu of the other yeah. ones now to a post Clearly, post-apocalyptic, almost Mad Max with you know other elements uh, thrown in, kind yeah, of uh, that, 
world. That setting is just like um how already in advanced, I would call it. Yeah, it's like I mean, I guess like sort of Mad Max plus dying earth. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's just like I just um I actually wrote a long time ago, I wrote a Mortu and Kyra story and I put it in um a sword and sorcery world. It's one of the few things that, that like, you know, I'll write and I'll write a couple pages of something and it's not going anywhere and I'll, I'll just leave it alone for a year or two. Then I'll come back to it and finish it. Um, it's sort of one of the few things that was like, I read it and I was like, oh, there, there's some things I like, but this thing's just DOA. Yeah, you know? it needs some work. Yeah, it just, there's something wrong with it. And, um, and I was like, well, I really like these guys. I really like more to and Kairos. and it's it's such a it's such a like a an indulgence and like a treat for me because i can have my grim barbarian and i also have this smart ass like but you know it's like you know five and the gray mouse are just you know yeah. not reinventing the wheel yeah well um, in a certain sense you kind of are and kind of aren't in that no, regard, that's, that's, there's no, definitely that's some the differences that you're usually yours yeah and like no one's no one's making anything out of whole cloth and no one's uh, necessarily ripping anybody off either. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's just how it is. Everything is synthetic. Um, you have to oh. go back a long, long time before you're talking about somebody really inventing something, you know? Yeah, well, then again, yeah. I haven't seen that many Nestorian Christians monks being turned into monkeys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, where did you get the it's idea tough. for that? One, I haven't uh, seen in any fiction really that I've read uh, the Nestorian branch of Christianity being used as, you know, a character's, you know, background yeah. or having that guy be a monkey. It, it's, it's all just, um, I think, uh, you know, maybe it's the time I grew up or whatever, but someone did a study that you can Google this, that like comic books that had apes on the cover always sell better. <laughs> I've seen that didn't. study. Yeah. And, um, you know, so um, was a time. I find, um, you know, I was taking these like anthropology classes and stuff. I find primates very amusing, you know, and, and uh, very uh, uh, fascinating. And, um, you know, Kairos is a, ex, you know, his is a quote. He's like, you know, he's he was in a monastery. Um almost better to think of it as, as just being a religious order. Mm -hmm. But uh, he said, except for the requirement of humility, I was the greatest of my order. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, like, so he's this... Um, that is a perfect line yeah, for him. Yeah. And like, you know, except, you know, um, he's, a, he's a really good guy, but uh, he's, he's extremely verbose. He's extremely full of himself. He's extremely impressed with his own um, education and knowledge, you know. Um, and what better package than to just put him in the body of a ridiculous, small, furry, cute monkey? It's just, it just works so well. Yeah, especially and, in um, the uh, follow-ups to the second story you made, uh, The Judgment of... Uh... Dagana, oh, yeah, Dagana, where he gets mm -hmm. caught by some rich people, uh, some rich yeah. people given to their kid, and the kid just dresses him up like a little doll for tea parties. Yeah, yeah, and um, the ultimate indignity. Yeah, this is so. I mean, because you you have to fuck with these characters, you know what I mean? Like you yeah. just have to, otherwise there's no, there's nothing happening, and um. You know, it's not going to just torture him or mess with him or something. Or, but you know, so like, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to him? You know what I mean? You have to like entertain a spoiled child, you know, on pain of death. And uh, and you know, uh, it's so much fun because he gets uh, he has to rise to the occasion. He manages to escape in a fantastical way, and um, you know, manages to work his way to where uh, Mortu is being imprisoned. And he just babbles on and on about what happened. And uh, more two turns to the the woman, the 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 local woman that he's getting information from, and he just looks at her and says, "You know, he frequently exaggerates." You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, he doesn't even get any credit for uh, amazing 
escapade that he that he went through. That is one thing I like about uh, so far all your stories. You have a certain elevation of language that I think you probably got mostly from Vance, if I'm not but, mistaken. Yeah, yeah. and um, that and, I think uh, really suits the you know the kind of stories that you write. My mom was uh, uh and she she she's retired now, so thank God. But uh, she was an English teacher, and she was um, you know, I just lived in a house just groaning from the weight of the books you know my dad obviously he was into that stuff and my mom and like I grew up watching um you know masterpiece theater and stuff with her and just just tons and tons of pbs oh I and, remember um, that you know and I grew up in uh western pa and um place where the mills were dying and like you know I could code switch in a second you know what I mean like you know like I, well, how I'm babbling on now uh is is how i speak but uh you know at, at college i could turn it up a notch and um i can turn it down a notch if need be <laughs> but yeah it's just uh, language is is um in uh this is a chauvinistic but like you know it's just english is is a tremendous resource um i've always loved studying other languages uh and um right now i'm trying to get my french back don't say a word because I, I can't do it okay je vais pas um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, you had to I speak to a quebecer today but i used yeah. to you know in, in college i could um you know to pass the damn class you had to do interviews and things like that mm -hmm. and um i just i just adore french and uh um, I lived in Japan. I used to be conversational in Japanese. Um, there's, there's just so much uh, language study. It's just so fascinating and everything. And it's just amazing. Um, How much it kind of you know, influences the way a person of a certain culture will think. Based yeah, on the absolutely. words they have to express it. Yeah, and that's stuff that people argue about. Um, but uh, English is just, it's, English has the, just a giant toolbox it's just ridiculous yeah you know so what's that line that uh, the english took words from a little language clubbed them over the head and dragged them home yeah yeah it's it, it, the english it, the formation of english is so um long and torturous and, and bizarre um uh but then what did dumas say like uh he was trying to learn english and he said this isn't english this is just french badly pronounced um <laughs> Um, cause you know how many loan words there are. I mean, my God, oh, yeah. um, you know, entire categories of words, you know, A, B, L, V, T, O, I, N, but, um, you know, English, you can just get in there and you can power drift and take it right up to the edge. And, uh, you've just have such a giant vocabulary. I mean, it's, it's not something that you need to argue about. English has a massive vocabulary. And um, it's extremely easy to tweak things and immediately uh, just set a just set a mood. I, I like to deliberately use very very deliberate phrasing and um, um, I wouldn't say archaic, but just you know you know if Classic. you're trying to catapult somebody to twenty thousand years in the future or to a place that never existed. Um, you know your choice of language you could you know you know you could do these things any way you want there's no rules you can do these things any way you want but um but there's certain have, ways of doing it that'll be more yeah, effective you have, based on what you're trying to do exactly like um you have to be deliberate and you know when i'm reading vance or um howard or any of those guys like I'm I'm not existing in this world. I'm in that world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And by and large, that's uh gotta be due to the language, you know. And um, you know, you it's it's a it's a weapon that you can fumble and and it can go off and you can shoot yourself in the gut, but you know, you just do, you do your best. You gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. I mean, we've all read stuff um that we didn't like, but mm. Um, again, you know, um, I think I found you know, one of the ways that you did the story I'm currently wearing on my chest right mm -hmm. here. It was a story in uh, one of the Kirsova issues called The First American, yeah. which was involved. 
a little bit of time travel on the part of another character who's a American uh, astronaut. And yeah. I did notice that the way that the people from that time period, from this ancient, it's basically a Lovecraftian prehistory story. It's part yeah. of a series of different ones from mm -hmm. different authors. Highly recommend checking the, that issue out. It's really good. But the astronaut guy spoke in a certain way that was closer to how we would speak normally yeah. versus the more yeah. elevated kind of, you know, classical mm -hmm. sword sorcerer speech of the other characters. So you could get that distinction culturally between the two. Although he also spoke a little bit more highly. So you kind of get the feeling that he'd adapted himself and his yeah, way of talking to that. Language, yeah. 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 That was, um, that was interesting. That was, um, had to be very deliberate with that. Yeah, it was a really interesting issue. Um, that was uh, Misha Burnett's idea. Why he just wanted to wanted to sort of check that off his his bucket list, creating like the shared world to get into. Um, and that's a, that's a place where I could go back uh, for sure. I need you know I'm working on the edits. The, it's in the can, but I'm working on the edits for a new Morton Kyrus mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, if the Kickstarter works out, which it will, uh, there'll be uh, another novella in it. And I've got two, a couple other like random pieces that uh, basically kind of not, not forgot about, but uh, they were just hanging around. And uh, why not just put them in here in the, the, the second edition of Thune's Vision? Yeah. Before I forget, too, um, you know, if you're listening to this, uh, send me an email. And I will make sure that you find out about the crowdfunding campaign. Um, it's been off, Thune's Vision has been off the market um, a couple months now, probably. But uh, it sucks because I used to just once a week going on the Amazon because it was that there's some oh, yeah. whatever that KDP and be like, oh, cool. Somebody in Denmark bought it. No, oh, cool. Somebody bought it. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, like yeah. a nice, <laughs> fun thing in my week. Yeah. I um, picked up one of your stories from, uh, like, I was looking for everything I could find. Yeah. And I found this one. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's uh, reprinted in there. That's going to be in there. That was, oh, big... okay, good. This is from yeah, April was 2014, a... volume two, number five of Yeah, that was the first thing I sent out. And um, really? it was just like, uh, yeah, that the was Palace like, of the Androgyne by Schuler yeah. Hernstrom. Is it Schuler Hernstrom or Skyler Hernstrom? Skyler, yeah. Skyler? Okay, I've been mispronouncing but, um, this ever since I first read your name. Yeah, so Skyler Hernstrom. All. <laughs> but uh, that that story was just, I was like, I'm just going to write something freaking gone, though. Oh, yeah, that one's interesting. Bizarre as shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's real short, and it is utterly bizarre and fantastical. Um, and it's got, like, some pretty ridiculous humor in it you know what i mean oh, yeah that one read that one i said oh yeah this guy is a fan of vance this is the kind of humor yeah stuff yeah that he would use i'm gonna put on my vance hat for this and um that was a lot of fun that'll be in the second edition nice um i want more people to read that one that was a cool venue and it's yeah. a shame that was actually the last issue yeah i and also the last one on amazon because i picked this one up a while back then you know i went looking see okay if anything had changed on the amazon stuff yeah the only one they have left is like 200 bucks yeah i don't know that's some weird amazon seller thing yeah i guess they decide that you're now a collector's item for this one <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the people in there too so but that was a lot of fun to write that was, <coughs> um that was sort of entering into um sort of the salad days uh i was just churning stuff out mm -hmm. and uh i wrote a lot in like a three or four year period just a ton and it was a really good time and i'm for um i'm not going to complain i got uh two kids now oh yeah two kids and two step kids. congratulations crazy uh brady bunch thing but um uh so obviously i do not have as much time as i used to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's but, understandable uh, but thankfully i've been i was able to crank out that more tune kairos and um working on a larger uh crazy piece and sort of a and um it, it's basically i guess out uh, of the things i do say is fancy and but about this um barbarian who's uh plucked from the gallows in order to serve as the guardian of a uh um essentially a library these uh wizards this conclave of hyper powerful wizards um have agreed to share spells so one of their um uh 
conditions for this is that there has to be an independent agent to oversee this. So they uh, pluck this guy from the gallows, like I said, and um, do dozens and dozens of things to him to make him oh, no. uh, impervious to magic. <coughs> and uh, he's, uh, you know, so hilarity will ensue. But uh, that's a that that's a lot of fun. I'm also working on this, uh, like a science fiction thing. That'll probably that might turn into uh, a first proper novel. Oh. And that might be that might be a, a while in the making. Sort of trying to do this, um, uh, you know. Oh, this is, you got to start with some science fiction tropes, like you have faster than light travel, mm -hmm. which likely will never exist. But <coughs> um, got to have it. Um, so if you got fast and light travel, and there's a wormhole that takes people to the other side of the galaxy, actually so far that that you can't even see our galaxy from it. And um, they set up, there's massive exodus from sort of like, you know, Europe and the Americas. And uh, after colonies are established, you've got these dual governments, you got a lot going on. Yeah. Then the wormhole collapses. Oh, no. And so you have this, this new civilization that's isolated, has to reinvent itself. And they, they actually wind up with this crazy sort of um, traditionalist monarchy. And... Uh, that goes on for um, quite some time before it eventually collapses. And the hero is an ace pilot, um, uh, a hero from the uh, losing side. And uh, he gets involved with this uh, uh, desperate sort of intrigue because he's approached by uh, members of the New Republic to help them form a, uh, essentially like a foreign legion. Okay. Uh, that it's all tied into the reasons why that Republic was able to win that war. And, uh, you know, it's like, I'm trying to do some deep plotting here and spin things out. And, um, you know, that one's going to take a while, but, uh, yeah, I imagine you, yeah. yeah. Have, have you found that the uh, necessary to find certain, like uh, shift the way you work when you're doing something from short stories versus a full length novel? Yeah. Well, this, the, this piece in particular, um, I um, found it necessary to essentially, you know, I have a couple pages of notes on that world and those notes will expand because, um, you know, we need, um, everything's going to have to make perfect sense in this thing. And, uh, you know, it, it won't be, it, it's just going to take more, more groundwork definitely. And it won't be, um, uh is easy i did try a couple years ago um like i plotted out an entire novel and um i got about thirty thousand words into it and i'm like this feels dead this mm -hmm. feels completely dead like it you know there's no sort of spark in it yeah you know, the difficulty was, is like keeping up the pace and keeping up the energy yeah yeah, and uh, so I just abandoned it. I mean, I, I think that's uh, one of the reasons why somewhere. so much heroic fantasy and sword sorcery works so well for the short story format. Then, yeah, definitely, yeah. and and it, it definitely does. Like, um, you know, I, you know, I don't feel like I gave short stories enough credit until until sort of I had my, you know, awakening or whatever, and started getting into this stuff, but um it's just a fantastic medium. You know, you can just, you can just play and, and do things and, and do whatever you want. This, you know, uh, often in the precess is an incredibly large scale epic story and it's extremely short. I mean, you can do anything you want. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, uh, just really, uh, really, really like short stories and really, really, um, like you said, it, it very much, I think it's the, the best natural fit for heroic fiction. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. And like, I could find, like, I've been able to do things in novellas where, you, you know, you start things and, and uh, things happen and then you, you wrap them up and it's all very satisfying. There's no point when you're like, oh, come on, just get to it. And, um, you know, even in like, you know, real literature, um, you read Maupassant or, um, like Barry Hannah or anything, like, you know, uh, there's just short stories are pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah.
I mean, uh, to be honest, I have I can't remember the last time I read a nice big brick of a novel. I mean, I think yeah, I haven't either. Like, looking um, back at the ones I've got here, the biggest mm-hmm. ones I've got, the well, the biggest book I've got is obviously Lord of the Rings up there. But you know, beyond that, I've got mostly just you know compilations of short stories. I've got you know, yeah. John Carter over there. I got yeah, and yeah. like like the Vance I'm reading now, like I'm reading the collections of the Demon Prince novels. Um, by themselves, those novels are really short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, mean by, by today's written, standards, they're written before you know publishers decided like Tolkien-sized novels are the st- baseline, and you go bigger from there. And like I, I love Tolkien, but it's funny. It's almost like he's the exception that proves the rule. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, and you read Tolkien, and it's not like um, it is a different sort of thing. You know what I mean? It's not like pulse pounding action and and you know what i mean and yeah yeah he's, he's tired, not uh, it, it's not the broken sword you know yeah yeah exactly yeah, he's, that he's, is like exactly that's like if, if heroic fantasy is like a spectrum and you got howard on one end and tolkien on the other that particular yeah. story is right there in the middle but yeah the i actually got it i got a i have an old copy but i got another copy because i need to revisit that one mm-hmm. that's such a uh <clears throat> that's yeah such that's a classic copy. yeah like yeah but like um nice. another guy i love reading is uh h beam piper like mm-hmm. not that's a uh, lensman yes oh uh, no that's oh god now i'm never gonna remember that guy's name <laughs> this okay, guy yeah, I'm, I'm mixing him up writing these stories about um i'm really bad at like if this were jeopardy i would lose even though i love all this crap <laughs> um I'm not much better when it comes to thinking these things up on yeah. the fly. Um, he got famous for writing those uh, fuzzy stories about like this semi sentient little creatures. Um, there's a lot of like sci fi you can like bite into there, mm-hmm. like as far as the, you know, but uh, he wrote this thing called Space Viking. Ooh. And it is, it's, you know, this is it. Yeah. And uh, there is the kind of thing you can fit in your back pocket. Yeah. And um, it's real interesting stuff. It's real, uh, um, like hyper realistic and violent. It's really good. Um, I'm not gonna sw- circle back around and say it one more time because uh, I don't want Neil to get mad at me. But uh, <laughs> um, you can put my email down below, right? Oh, all links are gonna yeah. be yeah. Uh... Yeah. So you know, I get emails. Uh, I've gotten emails from people. Hey, man, you know, check out this. I really like it. You know, I got to compile all those and send them out. But uh, if you want the heads up on the Thunes Vision Second Edition, just shoot me an email. Just shoot me an email. Um, eventually, I'll have a website with the newsletter and all this other stuff. Yeah. But uh, now, in the meantime, you've got an Instagram where you show off your Warhammer miniatures. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, I barely even talk about the writing on there. Yeah, yeah. Speaking I think that, of, you've gotten really deep into the those things, uh, as far as I could tell. Lots of uh, pretty good uh, painting you've been doing on those. Yeah, I think that's that's like a real low 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 key fun way to just uh, get your creativity out. Like when I sit down and like, okay, I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna work on. You know, I really wish. Uh, you know, I had access to like a proper atelier. I could sit and and sketch. Mm. um live models and things like that and learn anatomy from somebody you know just like do it all properly i would love to do that i love um i love art i love like classical art i love uh you know like there's neoclassicists the, the neo-raphaelites you know um that the french uh french realists go like bougereau and all those guys it's just god i love that stuff and um but you know it's funny it's like you know you know, you can smear shit on a wall and say it represents whatever. And maybe it does, you know, congratulations. You know, yeah, it represents but, it in but, your head, but the rest yeah. of us have to deal but with like, you know, looking at and trying to figure out what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. If you want to to paint or or sketch something that looks like what it is you're trying to show, even though, you know, our eyes are our eyes and brains are involved, it's not like a photograph. Um, it takes a ton of work. It mm-hmm. takes a ton of work, you know, even if people are naturally talented and gifted and stuff, it takes a tremendous amount of work to uh, learn all that stuff. And I would, uh, yeah, and practice, practice, love to practice. do that. Yeah. But in the meantime, you know, you get a cool little 
cool little model of some chaos guy. You can sit there and paint it up and uh, glue some grass on the base and have a great time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, um, when I was in, uh, I think, let's say 10, no, I was in high school and uh, this kid I knew uh, was in a Warhammer 40K and I thought it was the coolest shit in the world, but um, it was just, uh, it, it was hard, really hard to get into that stuff. It was expensive. And like you needed a lot of periphery things, you know what I mean? You needed paints, you needed brushes, you needed all this shit. And um, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. But um, and then back in the day, Dragon Magazine would have those old Warhammer adverts with like the color photos, yeah, 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 and the, and the, the castle in the back. But that was the coolest shit in the world. Yeah, those but, little um, dioramas with like, oh, you know, man, all the little yeah. like, you know figurines about to attack each other. Man, I was I was just frothing hard. <laughs> and um and then you realize oh how much do these things cost yeah and oh. now it's funny complaining about it back then it's like well they weren't that expensive back then yeah you know? nowadays yeah it's like holy shit but yeah. uh you know um then when i was in the army uh the guy across the hall was painting up uh corn berserkers and i was like oh shit i'm i'm in on this stuff now there we go i'm getting, I'm getting a paycheck this is where this shit's going and uh <laughs> When I discovered uh, historical miniatures and stuff like that. And um, mm-hmm. it's just like, I, I, you know, it's funny. Like at one point my mom, like, what, you know, what, what do you want for Christmas or something? Anyway, she was introduced to the miniature hobby and she's like, you know, every, every man in your family, every generation, they've always done something in miniature, you know, mm-hmm. whether it be scale models or train layouts or something. So I think nice. it's partially genetic that you get obsessed with, you know, some part of your brain that should have been devoted to finding alternate paths to your hunting spot because you can't use the same path every time because then the animals will figure it out. Figure you know, out. Okay, I can't use the same exact paint job on yeah. this one because it's a different making model. Yeah, I have to like, adjust the camouflage just, just so. The sort of need need to solve a complex problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, all this, all this stuff that you have to get together for miniature painting and then the technique and then everything. It's like, you know, it is just, you know, a, a giant problem that you're trying to constantly trying to solve. And I think it just if, if your brain is set up a certain way, no matter who you are, if your brain is set up a certain way, you're going to be into it. And then the other side of that is the gaming, which yeah. um, which is a lot of fun, too. Oh, you yeah. know, You've this, gotten pretty deep into AD&D, as I recall. You start DMing oh, that. yeah. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to put this on the historical record right now. Jeff Rowe Johnson, uh, I'm proud to say he's a friend of mine, is taking a mace and braining the RPG world as we know it. <laughs> he is wrecking them. He is wrecking their shit because, and anyone who's in RPGs for any length of time has heard all this shit about how AD&D is a mess. AD&D is unplayable. And, um, they took a little piece of AD&D where they said, and, you know, at some point in the AD&D rule book, they said, you know what, you know, Gagax says, uh, you, you might have to change some stuff, you know, just figure it out. You might have to. Yeah, rule uh, zero. It'll be a dispute. And, yeah. And um, people took that and um, it's like, we all know that there might be some circumstance where you have to kill somebody, you know, they're, you know, in self-defense or war, there are some circumstances you might have to kill somebody. And that's okay. And what people heard was, you might have to kill somebody, and that's okay. And they just started murdering motherfuckers everywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just everyone became a serial killer. That's oh. what happened with World of Zero. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, I got to change rules. Oh, kill. that yeah. is a beautiful metaphor, right there. Yeah, and like, and like, um, you know, we all know, uh, you know, the the pedantic, annoying nerd lives within all of us to a greater or lesser degree and not um, many of the greater degrees yeah and like i have been lucky enough to like a really good friend of mine scott Pyle. he's just just a fucking prince this guy's one of the best guys i've ever known um he designs miniatures games he's written dozens of rule sets over the years and uh he's dabbled in like rpg elements and stuff too like he's played tons and tons of games he knows exactly what he's talking about and he knows exactly what he's doing i'm not talking about him you know what I mean? Mm. I'm talking about that other guy that just is just smelling. Well, actually, yeah, exactly. You know, um, 
anybody can make a game. Anybody who wants to make a game should make a game. You know what I mean? And see mm -hmm. what happens and see what it's all about. But uh, the other side of that is, you know, um, if you're going to play the game, play the game. Yeah, play the goddamn game. Because I've known people who have, you know, like bought a game, like a board game or an RPG yeah. and something. And the first thing you do isn't read the rules. It's thinking, what can I house rule? Yeah, yeah, it's like totally. You and haven't so even like, familiarized yourself with how it plays and you're already starting to fiddle with it. AD&D, &D, rules as written, came from a tremendous amount of thought and experience. And it's fucking awesome. And... Jeffro Johnson is bringing that message to the world right now. And like the prophets of the Old Testament, he oh, he's going to love that. He's being like persecuted for it. Not to give a shit. <laughs> well, no one but, likes like, to see their sacred don't, cows. People gig, don't want to hear the message. Yeah, nobody you know, likes to see their sacred like, cows getting slaughtered. Yeah, no one's like, you're not supposed to have an eight titty golden fertility idol in your house. God's going to be mad about that. They say, well, fuck you. I think it ties the whole room together. You know what I mean? In and, in my defense, it really does. Yes, there you go. So, um, <laughs> but I'm putting it on the historical record right now. I put Jeff on his path completely innocently. I wanted to play A D and D because um I'd always I was back when I was a kid, I had the books, couldn't get it together, couldn't find people, couldn't oh, yeah, me too. And it was like on my bucket list. I was like I don't want to play whatever. I can, I can go play whatever, wherever. I want to play AD and D. I want to play. At, I want to play this game with these cool books, you know, and I own stills, whatever. But like, I, I wanted to play it, and so I ran it, and um, it was like I told the guys, um, my little close uh, cabal of uh, online buddies, is like, like um, we're just gonna have to muddle through this, and I'm just gonna have to figure it out because I don't know what I'm doing. And so, you know, we played and we had a good time. I think we only were able to do three sessions before life just shit on all over everything like it always does. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Jeffro, you know, was a participant and he's like, fuck it, I I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? And so he just ran with it. Yeah, and like Jeffro has a higher saving throw against life bullshit <laughs> and everything. And like he ran that campaign for... Mm -hmm a lot of sessions and now the campaign is still going on uh in, in, in sort of a you know season two or whatever under uh my buddy brian renninger and like you know jeff Rowe eventually come back to it but uh but i'm extreme i feel like a part of history like i don't know like i shot the archduke or something <laughs> and all this shit happened and it's so awesome i mean like uh -huh. i'm not on twitter but like i see my bros posting about it Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like the, the RPG of sphere is, is just on fire. Yeah. It's just, Oh, it's so awesome. It's so satisfying. Oh, oh man. That's of course, this isn't your first uh, tie to the gaming, uh, to the tabletop gaming world. Can you tell what can you tell me about Tyronis Isle of Goblins? Oh, so that was my buddy, Scott Pyle. And uh, ironically, Scott's uh, responsible for me getting into the writing um me and scott have just been friends for forever and uh um i have my buddy that did 40k so i get out of the army i'm like man i'm gonna go to a game store i'm gonna go see what this is all about and uh and i met scott there and uh like scott's one of those people that 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 you know um you know, we like I like to lay around and think about things. Um, I think wouldn't it be great if I did X? Scott actually does X. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So he he had like at one point in time he had like a relationship with a a, a figure manufacturer and he got all these like he likes comics. We love like comics, so he actually got this thing super figs and it had like hundreds of figures. Mm -hmm. And like it was like the only the only thing going for the longest time with like mm -hmm. superhero game. And um, over the years, I was uh, either helped him play test or just kibitz or just just was around when he wrote all these various different rule sets under what's called the, the goal system banner. And um, uh, at one point, and I don't know how the conversation went, but like, uh, uh, I was like, you know, I'll write a little fluff fiction. I'll write some fluff fiction for your rule set. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, 
And then in the case of the Tyronis, he wrote a D20 supplement about this floating island of goblins. It, it had been created by this wizard who had passed away. So these goblins were just floating around on this island with this whole civilization. And it was um, it was just really kick-ass and cool. And um, I got to write um, a lot of the fluff and descriptive text for things and uh, a little bit mm-hmm. of the history. And I wrote a little piece about a, a human explorer encountering these guys and stuff. And that was just a, that was a great, that was a lot of fun. And uh, it came out and like, that's, you know, just if um, there are thousands and thousands of D20 supplements. Yeah. This one was published in 2005. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just like one of those little incremental steps, because like, you know, you work on your chops um, and uh, that type of fiction, you know, it's not like a whole sort of story. So. Yeah, more you know, like vignettes uh, that, you know. Yeah, exactly. Do, so just examples. Really, really fun to do. It's funny, when I was in the Navy, um, my uh, general quarter station was, uh, at one point, it was a chaff launcher. One of the chaff launchers on oh, top boy. of the deck, which is just like, like, really? Like, like something's going to happen, and I'm going to be like one of the three guys that get killed because I'm <laughs> sitting on top of the, sh- on, on the main deck like a jackass in this Darth Vader helmet, you know? Um, but, uh, there was an incident where we went to GQ and, uh, one of the guys in the chaff team was, uh, he was just gone for like 20 minutes and he finally shows up and, uh, the, the, um, NCO, the, the petty officer in charge of that, that thing just, just fucking lit into him, just went off. And it, um, this is the nineties and uh you know if that had happened in the 70s they could beat the shit out of the guy no one <laughs> but um we're yeah. starting to get a little starting to get a little weird so uh it, it was an incident and uh an officer had come and told me and told me to write what i'd seen you know write what happened <laughs> so i wrote this page you know got on, a, got on the computer wrote a page printed handed to him about 20 minutes later he comes back to me he goes and that was really well written <laughs> Your first uh, literary, yeah, my criticism. first, my first submission, yeah, it, was, it went really well. <laughs> yeah, just change these these things, and we'll be able to publish it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go try to pitch the screenplay out there. Yeah, oh, Jack man. Has it was late for his drill. But yeah, oh, good times, good times. <laughs> so, I think we've covered pretty much absolutely everything that we can cover in about an hour so my final question that i ask all my literary uh, guests the weird tales three howard lovecraft clark ashton smith order of preference and why um i think that it would have to go howard first Mm -hmm. because um then it would go Clark Ashton Smith, and then it would go Lovecraft. Um, and, you know, if you would flip that whole thing, I think you can make an equally compelling case. Howard uh, is going to be on top for me because um, just the passion there. Do you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. What oh, it means yeah. to be human, what it means to fight, what it means to survive, what it means to win, what it means to lose. Uh, that's, you know, Howard, uh, Clark Ashton Smith is just, um, so good at what he does. You know what I mean? The man was a poet. Yeah. And just, just a master and Lovecraft, um, just for the, uh, inventiveness. One of my favorite Lovecraft things, everyone always talks about Cthulhu and obviously that stuff's awesome. Oh yeah. But like, um, the doom that came to Sarnath. Oh yeah. Oh, I had that book. It doesn't even have a main character. Yeah. It's, the character is young. Sarnath. Yeah. And it's just like, it's awesome. And um, I could, if, if, you know, in my desert island reading list to make sure that I had with me is the, the dream quest of Unknown, Unknown Kadath. Yeah. Yeah. The, oh, that He's is- dreaming. It's just like, oh my God, this is so fucking good. You know? Yeah. The men like, of Lang with their strange yeah, turbans, hiding oh, horns and such. Oh, the ghouls. The, the, ga- the war with the gugs. Oh, my God. Yeah. I did a cool drawing of a gug. Um, but, like, man, that stuff is good. I mean, like, 
It's like, oh yeah, you got a Cthulhu plushie, great. You know what I mean? But like, yeah. this is cool. this stuff is awesome. Yeah. yeah, like Cthulhu stuff is this is the stuff that you know became the most popular, but it's not necessarily yeah. his best. In certain no, ways. and it's good. At least I mean, depending I'm not on your taste. There tell anybody it's not good or like oh you shouldn't be reading that you know no 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 it's all good but like um like in uh like the unknown cutoff it's just like it's extremely poetic and it has this um and i get hooked on this stuff uh you know because i'm always thinking about uh you know the end of things you know when that when civilizations switch and when things go bad that's always the most interesting and poignant uh, you know, you just look at the Roman Forum and it's just like um, people flock there. It was a tourist thing because they go there and they look at it and they they can just almost feel like what it had been, yeah. you know. And like that's the type of stuff that's in um, a lot of these lesser known, I wouldn't say lesser known, but lesser celebrated Appreciated. Lovecraft. Yeah, Lovecraft stories. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, and it's like I said with those guys. If someone switches that order, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get in a knife fight with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, yeah. it's stuff. a perfectly acceptable order, and it is pretty similar to mine too. Oh, cool. Yeah. So yeah. it's nice to meet like a man of good friend. taste. Yeah. <laughs> <And> remember, <laughs> email me. Email this man if you want to know more about and just if you want to say good work on everything that you've done so far. And if you want to know what you were warned about the upcoming crowdfunding for the new edition of Thune's vision, send them an email. That's going to be a blast. I feel like we're, we're turning a corner with like, um, you know, it's all these weird things going on, all these awesome small publishers, oh, yeah. self-publishing, which have gone out of, but, and then like uh, hit up DMR books. Oh got, yeah. Got, DMR books are awesome. Uh, they published the eye of Sunu, which is a collection of all your uh, Kursova. Yeah, stories. And that's got some of my favorite stuff in there. That the um, it's just got a lot of cool stuff, and it also has the first Mortoon Kyra story in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, um, the Law of Wolves, which I just that yeah, was kinda, uh, that was a cool one, kind of dark yeah. fairy tale kind of story. Yeah, yeah, teared up right in that. But yeah, I'll let you guys go. But um, hit it me has up been a pleasure know. talking to you, sir. Yeah, I'm glad we got to do this. Sorry. Is man, life. schedules are schedules, that's how it life. works. Oh, god, life is awful, it's the worst. It'll be a month. <laughs> well, life is awful, except the alternative, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would like to thank everybody for coming to watch. Thank you to Skylar Hernstrom, finally got his name pronounced right for show for talking to us. And I will see you all next time. Until next yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs>